Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Um, so this is going to be our last lecture that's given by Alexander and myself. And traditionally, this is one of my favorite lectures uh, where we're going to discuss some of the limitations of deep learning algorithms that we've been learning about, as well as some of the new and emerging research frontiers that are enjoying a lot of success in both theory and application today. OK, so first things first, we're going to cover some logistical information, given that this is the last lecture that we'll be giving prior to our guest lectures. So the first point is regarding the class t-shirts. Thank you to everyone who came by yesterday and picked up t-shirts. I will note, importantly, that the t-shirts, we have a lot of t-shirts this year um, due to backlog from, from last year. So the t-shirts today are going to be different than those that you may have received yesterday. The t-shirts today are our specific class t-shirts. And we really, really like these as kind of a way for you all to remember the course and you know, uh, signify your participation in it. So please come by if you would like these, one of these t-shirts. And um, cannot guarantee that they will be there remaining tomorrow or Friday due to the demand. So please come by today. It will be in 10 to 50 where the in-person office hours are right after this lecture completes. So to recap on where we are right now and where we are moving forward, as you've seen, we've you know, pushed through deep learning at sort of this breakneck pace. And we've done this split between our technical lectures and our hands-on project software labs. So in the remaining four lectures after this one, we're going to actually extend even further from some of the new research frontiers that I'll introduce today to have a series of four really exciting guest lectures from leading industry researchers and uh, academic researchers in the field. And I'll touch briefly on what they'll each be talking about in a bit. But please note that we're really, really lucky and privileged to have these guest speakers come and participate and join our course. So highly, highly encourage and recommend you to join and to join synchronously specifically. As far as deadlines and where things stand with the labs submissions and the final project assignments, Lab 3 was released today, the Reinforcement Learning Lab. All three labs are due tomorrow night at midnight, uploaded to Canvas, and there are going to be specific instructions on what you need to submit for each of the three labs um, for that submission. And again, since we've been receiving a lot of questions about this on Piazza and by email, the submission of the labs is not required to receive a grade, uh, to receive a passing grade. This is simply for entry into each of the three project competitions. What is required to receive credit for the course is either the deep learning paper review or the final project presentation. We'll get into more specifics on those in a couple of slides as a reminder, but these are both due Friday, the last day of class. OK, so about the labs, really, really exciting. Hopefully, you've been enjoying them. I think they're, I mean, they're awesome. I think they're awesome, but that's also because I'm biased because um, we, we made them. But nevertheless, right, really exciting opportunity to enter these cool competitions and win some of these awesome prizes. In particular, again, reminding you that they're going to be due tomorrow night. And so for each of the labs, we have selected a prize that kind of corresponds with the theme of that lab. Hopefully, you'll appreciate that. And as Alexander mentioned, again, I'd like to highlight that for lab three, focusing on reinforcement learning for autonomous vehicle control, there's the additional opportunity to actually deploy your model if you are a winner on MIT's um, full-scale self-driving autonomous vehicle. OK. Couple notes on the final class projects. Won't go too in detail because these are, this is summarized on the slides as well as on the course syllabus. But the critical action item for today is that if you are interested in participating in the final project proposal competition, you must submit your name of your group by tonight at midnight. I checked the sign up sheet right before starting this lecture, and there's a lot of spaces open, so plenty of opportunities for you to be eligible and to compete and to you know, pitch us your ideas and be eligible for these prizes. Again, more on, more on the logistics of this on the syllabus and on this summary slide. The second option, as you may know, is the, for, the, for receiving credit for the course is the written report of a deep learning paper. And the instructions for this summarized on the syllabus, it will be due by the end of class 3.59 p.m. Eastern Time on this Friday. 
Okay, so that covers most of the logistics that I wanted to touch on. The last and very exciting point is the amazing and fantastic lineup of guest lectures that we have uh, slotted for tomorrow's lecture time as well as Friday's lecture time. Briefly, I'll, I'll talk about each of these amazing speaker sets and what they're going to talk about and contribute to our, our exploration of deep learning. So first, we're going to have two speakers from this really exciting emerging self-driving car company, Innoviz, and they're going to be talking about using a data modality called LiDAR to train and build deep learning models for autonomous vehicle control. Our second lecture will be from Jasper Snook from Google Research and Google Brain in Cambridge. He's going to be talking about the role and importance of uncertainty in deep learning models. I'll introduce a little bit about this as a prelude to his lecture uh, today. Next, we'll have Professor Anima Anand Kumar from NVIDIA and Caltech. She's the head of AI research of all of NVIDIA, and she's going to give a talk which I personally am super excited about on the applications of AI for science and how we can do this in a really principled manner. And finally, we're going to have Miguel and Jenny from RevAI, which is a company that specializes in natural language processing and automatic speech recognition. And they'll be talking about some of their recent research and product development in this line. For all of these uh, four series of lectures, I highly, highly encourage you to attend these synchronously and in person. Uh, excuse me, synchronously live virtually. Um, the reason is that we have been publishing the recordings for Alexander and I's lectures on Canvas, but we will need to uh, share our, these, these lecture recordings with our guest speakers for full company approval prior to publishing them on our course website, and so this may take time. So we cannot guarantee that the lectures will be uh, shortly accessible via recording. So please, please, please try to attend live synchronously if you can. Okay, so that was a breakneck run through of the logistics of where we've been, where we're going for the remainder of the course. And as usual, if you have any questions, please direct them to me and Alexander uh, via Piazza or by email. Great. So now let's dive into the really, really exciting part and the core technical content for this last lecture. So, so far, right, 6S191, it's a class about deep learning and why deep learning is so powerful and so awesome. And we've specifically seen the rise of deep learning algorithms in a variety of different application domains and begun to understand how it has the potential to revolutionize so many different research areas and parts of society ranging from advances in autonomous vehicles and robotics to medicine, biology, and healthcare, reinforcement learning, generative modeling, robotics, finance, security, and the list goes on and on. And hopefully now, as a result of this course, you have a more concrete understanding of how you can take deep learning and neural network approaches and apply them in your own research, for example, or in, in lines of investigation that may be of interest to you. And with that, you've also come away with some understanding of how the foundations of these algorithms actually function and what that means for actually enabling some of these incredible advances. Specifically, on you know, taking a step back about what this learning problem even means. So far, we've been, been seeing algorithms that can move from raw data and train a neural model to output some sort of decision, like a prediction, a classification, taking some action. And this was the case for both supervised learning examples as well as reinforcement learning examples. And we've also seen the inverse, right, where we're trying to now instantiate and create new data instances based on some learned probability distribution of the data, as was the case with unsupervised learning and generative modeling. Now, what's common to both these directionalities it's the fact that neural networks, if you really abstract it, everything away, what you can think of them as is very, very powerful function approximators. All they're, learn all they're doing is learning a mathematical and computational mapping from data to decision or vice versa. And to understand this in a bit more detail, I think it's very helpful to go back to a very famous theorem that was proposed back in 1989 called the Universal Approximation Theorem. 
And at the time, it generated quite the stir in the community because it states this very, very bold and powerful statement that it then proves in theory and in math, which is that a feed-forward neural network with just a single neural layer is absolutely sufficient to approximate any arbitrary function uh, to any, uh, any arbitrary continuous function to any arbitrary precision. And so far, right, in this class, we've been exploring this concept of deep neural models, right, which constitute taking these individual neural layers and stacking them into a hierarchy. But the universal approximation theorem is saying, OK, you don't even need to stack layers together. All you need is one layer. You can have as many nodes, as many neurons as you want, and you should be able to approximate a continuous function to some arbitrary precision. So what does this really mean, right? What this theorem is kind of getting at is, let's say you have some problem, and you believe that you can reduce your problem down to a set of inputs and a set of outputs that can be related to each other via a continuous function. If that's the case, in theory, you could build a neural net that could solve that problem, that could learn that mapping. That's pretty powerful. But if we take a step more closely, right, there, there are a bit of a few caveats to this theorem and what it's stating. Firstly, it's making no claims or guarantees on the number of units, the number of neurons that could be necessary to achieve you know, this, this continuous function prediction. And furthermore, it leaves open the question of how do you actually find the weights that could solve this problem and actually result in this architecture. It doesn't tell you how you could go about doing this. It just says the weights may exist, right? And finally, and perhaps most importantly, this theorem is making no claims about how well this neural net function would be able to generalize beyond the setting that it was trained on. And this theorem, I think, gets at a, a larger historical um, issue that was present in the computer science community, which is this idea of this per possible overhype about the promise of artificial intelligence and the promise of deep learning in particular. And for us as a community, you know, you're all here clearly interested in learning more about deep learning. I think we need to be extremely careful in terms of how we market and advertise these algorithms. Because while the universal approximation theorem makes a very powerful claim, the reality is that such potential overhype that could result from either theory or some of the success that deep learning algorithms are enjoying in practice could, in truth, be very, very dangerous. And in fact, historically, there were two so-called AI winters where research in artificial intelligence and in neural networks specifically came to an abrupt uh, decline because of this issue of concern about you know, what could be the p potential um, downstream consequences of AI and whether these methods would actually be robust and generalizable to real world tasks. And so in keeping with this spirit and being mindful about what are the limitations of these types of technologies, in the first part of this lecture, we're going to dive deeply into some of the most profound limitations of modern deep learning architectures. And hopefully you'll get a sense of why these types of limitations arise and start to think about how we can actually, in the future, advance research to mitigate some of these, these uh, limitations. The first example is one of my favorites and uh, something that I like to highlight every year, which is this idea of generalization. How well will a neural network generalize to unseen examples that it may not have encountered before during training? And so there was this really beautiful paper in 2017 that took a very elegant approach to exploring this problem. And all they did was they took images, right? from this data set called ImageNet, very, very famous data set in computer vision. And in this data set, these simple images right, are associated with a class label, an individual class label. And what the authors of this paper did was they took each of these images, and for each of them, they flipped a coin 
or, flip, or flipped a die, right, a k-sided die, where the number of the uh, sides of the die were the number of possible classes that they wanted to assign a label to to each of these images. And instead of taking the existing true class label for a corresponding image, they used the result of that random sample to assign a brand new label to each of the images in the data set. And what this meant is that now the images were no longer associated with their true class label just had a random assignment. And in fact, two images that could, in truth, belong to the same class could now be mapped to completely different classes altogether. So the effect of this is that they're trying to randomize their labels entirely. From this, they then asked, OK, now we have this data set where we have images with completely random labels. What happens if we train a neural network on this data set? That's exactly what they did. And as you may, they, they trained their, their model on this random uh, labeled data set and then tested it on a test set where the true labels were preserved. And as you could expect, in the testing set, the error and the accuracy of this network, the accuracy of the network fell uh, sort of exponentially as a function of the degree of random in it, randomness imposed in the label assignment process. What was really interesting, though, was what they observed when they now looked at the performance on the training set. And what they found was that no matter how much they randomized the labels of the data, the model was able to get nearly 100% accuracy on the training set. What this means is that no modern neural networks can basically perfectly fit to entirely random data. And it highlights this idea that the universal approximation theorem is getting at, right? That deep neural networks or neural networks in general are just very, very powerful function approximators that can fit some arbitrary function even if it has entirely random labels. To drive this point home even further, again, this idea that neural networks are simply excellent function approximators Let's consider this 2D example, right, where we have some points lying on a 2D plane, and we're trying to fit a function using a neural network to this data. What the neural network is doing is learning a maximum likelihood estimate of the, of the training data in that region where it has observations. And so if we give the, our model a new data point, shown here in purple, that falls somewhere on that training distribution of data that it has seen before, yeah, we can expect that our neural network would be able to predict a reasonable maximum likelihood estimate for that data point. But what happens now if we consider the out of distribution region? What is occurring? What is the uh, neural network predicting on regions to the left and to the right of these purple points? Well we have absolutely no guarantees on what the data could even look like in these regions. And as a result, we have no guarantees on how the function in truth could behave. And this is a huge, huge limitation that exists in modern deep neural network architectures, which is this question of how do we know when our network doesn't know? How can we establish guarantees on the generalization bounds of our network? And how can we use this information to inform the training process, the learning process, and the deployment process? And so a slight revision to this idea of neural networks being excellent function approximators is the idea that, yes, they are excellent function approximators, but really only when they have training data. And to build off this the idea a little further, I think there can be this popular conception, which we've seen can be really inflated by the media and the popular press, is that deep learning is basically magic, alchemy. It can be the be-all, end-all solution to any problem that may be of interest, right? And so this spawns this belief, which is incorrect, that you can take some arbitrary training data, apply some magical, beautiful, complex network architecture, turn the crank on the learning algorithm, and expect it to spit out excellent results. 
but that's simply not how deep learning works. And I want you to be really, really mindful of this as it's perhaps the most important thing to take away if you're actually going to try to build deep neural models in practice. This idea of garbage in, garbage out. Your data is just as important, if not more important, than the actual architecture of the network you're trying to build. So this motivates some discussion of what I think is one of the most pertinent and important failure modes of neural networks, highlighting just how much they depend on the nature of the data on which they're trained. <clears throat> so let's say we have this black and white image of this dog, and we pass it into some convolutional neural network architecture, and our task is to train this network to colorize this black and white image, to paint it with color. The result when this example was passed into some you know, state-of-the-art CNN was what you see here on the right. Look closely and what can you notice? There's this pink region under the dog's nose, which I think hopefully you can all appreciate is actually the dog's fur, but the network is predicting that it should be pink. Why could this be the case? Well, if you consider what could be some of the examples of the data that the, was used to train this network? Probably pictures of dogs, right? And amongst those pictures of dogs, it's very, very likely that many of those images will be of dogs sticking their tongues out, right? Because that's what dogs do. And so the CNN, this convolutional architecture that's trained to colorize a black and white image, may have learned to effectively map the region under the dog's nose to be the color pink. And so what this example really highlights is that deep learning models are powerful at building up representations based on the data that they have seen during training. So this raises the question of, OK, yeah, you've told me that you know, neural networks depend on very, very heavily on the distribution and the nature of the data that they're trained on. But what happens if now they're deployed in the real world and they have to encounter and handle data instances where they may not have encountered before? Very infamously and very tragically, a few years ago, a an autonomous vehicle from Tesla that was aut operating autonomously uh, ended up crashing in a major accident and resulting in the death and the killing, uh, the, the death of the driver. And it turned out in fact, that that driver who was killed in this crash had in fact reported multiple instances over the prior weeks in which his, his or her, their car would, um, would, would behave abnormally, would swivel and turn towards this highway barrier, which turned out to be the very same barrier into which the car ended up crashing. And what was revealed was when they looked at this instance a little bit further was that it turned out as they were able to investigate from Google Street View images was that some years ago in the in the data on which the autonomous system uh, was built on it lacked the actual physical construction of this barrier that was uh, that ended up being the barrier into which the car uh, crashed later on and so effectively what this instance highlights was that the car had encountered a real-world data example that was an out-of-training distribution example and was unable to handle this situation effectively, resulting in this accident and the death of the driver. And so this idea of potential failure modes have very, very significant real-world consequences. And it's these very same types of failure modes and this notion of what could be safety critical applications that motivate the need for really being able to understand when the predictions from deep learning models can or cannot be trusted. Effectively, when, when the network's predictions are associated with a degree of uncertainty. And this is a very emerging research uh, direction in, in deep learning that's important to a number of safety critical applications. Autonomous driving, like I highlighted earlier, biology and medicine, facial recognition, and countless other examples. 
And beyond these types of real world applications, this notion of uncertainty is also very important from a more fundamental perspective, where we're thinking about how to build neural models that can handle sparse, limited, or noisy data sets that may, be, uh, that may carry imbalances with respect to the data or the features that are represented. And so Jasper, in his guest lecture tomorrow, will be focusing on this topic of uncertainty in deep learning and will give a really comprehensive overview of the field and talk, a well, talk as well about some of his recent research advances in this direction. And so to prepare a little bit for that and to set the stage for tomorrow's lecture, I'm going to touch briefly on this notion of uncertainty in deep learning to get intuition about what uncertainty means and what are the different types of uncertainties we can encounter in deep learning models. So to do that, let's consider a very simple classification example where we're given some images of cats and dogs. We train a model to predict and output a probability of the image containing a cat or the image containing a dog. Remember that importantly, our model is being trained to predict probabilities over a fixed number of classes. In this case, two, cat, dog. And so what could happen potentially when we now feed in a uh, an image that contains both a cat and a dog? Well, because these are probabilities that are being outputted over a fixed number of classes, the network is going to have to return estimates that ultimately sum to one. But in truth, right, this image is containing both a cat and a dog. So ideally, we'd like to generate a high probability estimate for cat, as well as a high probability estimate for dog. And so this type of example highlights this case where there can be noise or variabilities in our input data, such that even though we are able to use a traditional model to output a prediction probability in terms of the classification decision, that classification decision is not strictly associated with a sense of confidence or a sense of uncertainty in that prediction. And so this type of example where we have a noise or variability inherent to the data can result in a form of uncertainty known as aleatoric uncertainty or data uncertainty. Now let's suppose that instead of an image of containing both a cat and a dog, we input an image of a horse, right? And again, the network is being trained to predict dog or cat. And again, these probabilities will have to sum to one. So yeah, we can generate these probability estimates, but ideally, we want our network to be able to say, I'm not confident in this prediction. This is a high uncertainty estimate because this instance of an image of a horse is very, very unlike the images of the cats and dogs seen during training. And so this is an instance where the model is being tested on an out of distribution example, this horse. And so we again expect it to not be very confident in the prediction, to have a high uncertainty. But it's a fundamentally different type of uncertainty than simple data noise or data variability. Here, we're trying to actually capture the model's effective confidence in its prediction on a out-of-domain, out-of-distribution example. And this is this notion of epistemic uncertainty, or also model uncertainty. So these two types of uncertainties are commonly thought of as the dominant uh, forms of uncertainty in deep neural models, although I will say that there's also some hot debate in the field about whether these two uh, data and model uncertainties capture all the, the types of uncertainty that could exist. And so Jasper is going to dive really deeply into this topic, so I'm going to leave this discussion of uncertainty at that. And again, encourage you to please um, attend his lecture tomorrow because it will be very, very, um, really, really exciting. A third failure mode to consider, uh, in addition to you know, issues of generalization, issues of uh, extending to out of distribution regions and, and predicting uncertainty is what you may know and have heard of as adversarial examples. And the idea here is that we can synthetically construct a data instance that will function as an adversary to the network. 
we will fool it to generate an incorrect and spurious prediction. So the idea here is we can take an image and apply some degree of noisy perturbation that generates an adversarial example which to our eyes as humans looks fundamentally the same to our original input image. But the difference is that this perturbation actually has a profound effect on the network's decision, where with the original image, the network may correctly classify this image as an image of a temple. But upon applying this adversarial perturbation, the resulting prediction is now completely nonsensical, predicting with 98% probability that this image is actually of an ostrich. And so what is really clever and really important in this idea of adversarial generation and adversarial attacks is this perturbation piece. It appears to be random noise, but in truth, it's constructed in a very clever way so as to actually generate an example that will function effectively as an adversary. To understand how this works, let's recall our actual training operation when we're optimizing our neural network to um, according to some loss, according to some objective function. Recall that our objective here is to apply this algorithm gradient scent to optimize an objective or loss function L, or in this case, J. And specifically, what we're trying to adjust as a function of this optimization procedure is the weights of the neural network W. And we're doing this by constraining fixing our input image and its associated label, our input data and its associated label, and then asking how do small iterative adjustments in the network weights change the objective, change the loss with respect to our input data. With adversarial attacks, we're now doing in many ways the opposite optimization, where now we're asking how can we modify our input data by fixing the weights fixing the labels, and seeking to increase the loss as a function of this perturbation on the input data. And this is how we can tr actually train a neural network to learn this perturbation, uh, this, this, perturbation um, uh, this perturbation entity that can then be applied to an input image or an input data instance to create an adversarial attack. An extension of this idea and this example that I showed in the 2D case was uh, recently explored by a group of students here at MIT in Alexander Madry's research group, where they devised an algorithm for synthesizing examples, adversarial examples, that can be robustly adversarial, adversarial over a set of complex transformations like rotations, color changes, and so on. And they extended this idea not only in the 2D case, but also to the 3D case, such that they were able to show that they could actually use 3D printing techniques to synthesize physical adversarial examples in the real world that could then be taken, um, you could then take a picture of and use that picture to feed it into a model, which would then misclassify this actual uh, 3D object based on that 2D image. And so the example that they highlighted was these 3D printed turtles, where many of these adversarial turtle examples were actually incorrectly classified by a network as a rifle when um, the network was trained uh, to predict, predict the types of, um, you know, uh, the, the class label of the, of the image. OK. so. The final limitation that I'd like to very, very briefly um, touch on is this notion of algorithmic bias. And that's this idea which you've explored through our second lab, that neural network models, AI systems more broadly, can be susceptible to significant biases such that these biases can actually have potentially very real and potentially detrimental societal consequences. And so hopefully through the, your exploration of our second lab, you have begun to understand how these types of issues may arise and what could be strategies to actually effectively mitigate algorithmic bias. And so these limitations that I touched on are just 
the, the tip of the iceberg, right, in terms of what limitations currently exist. And it's certainly not an exhaustive list that I've written up here. But to highlight a little bit, again, in your lab, you have focused and uh, dove really deeply into this exploration of algorithmic bias in computer vision. And in tomorrow's guest lecture, we'll dive quite deeply into uncertainty and how um, we can develop methods for robust uncertainty estimation in deep learning. And in the second, second portion of this lecture today, I'm going to use the remaining time to tackle and discuss two other classes of limitations and use these classes of limitations in terms of structural information and actual optimization to introduce what are some of the new and emerging research frontiers in deep learning today. OK, so the first that I will dive into is um, this idea of encoding structure into deep learning architectures, imposing some sort of domain knowledge and some sort of knowledge about the problem at hand to intelligently design the network architecture itself to be better suited for the task at hand. And we've already seen examples of this, right? perhaps most notably in our exploration and discussion of convolutional neural networks, where the fundamental operation of the convolution was intricately linked to this idea of spatial structure in image data and in vision data. And we saw how we could use convolution as an operation to build up these networks that were capable of extracting features and preserving spatial invariants from spatial data. But beyond images, beyond sequences, there can be many, many different other types of data structures that exist, and namely ones that are more irregular than a standard 2D image, for example. And one really interesting data structure modality is that of graphs, which are a very powerful way to represent a vast variety of data types, from social networks to abstract state machines that are from theoretical computer science to networks of human mobility and transport, to biological and chemical molecules, as well as networks of proteins and other biological modules that may be interacting within cells or within the body. All of these types of data and all of these instances and application areas are very amenable to being thought of as a graph-based structure. And so this has motivated this really rapidly emerging field in deep learning today of extending neural networks beyond quote unquote standard encodings or standard data structures to cap capture more complicated data geometries and data structures such as graphs. And so today we're going to talk a little bit about graphs as, as a data structure and how they can uh, inspire a new sort of network architecture that is related to convolution but also a bit different. And so to discuss this, I'll I'll first remind you of how convolutional neural networks operate, right? Operating on 2D image data. Where, as we saw yesterday, the idea is to take a filter kernel and effectively, iteratively slide this kernel over input images or input features and do this process over the course of the entire uh, 2D image represented as it's a 2D matrix of numbers and do this in order to be able to extract local and global features that are present in the data in a way that is spatially invariant and preserves spatial structure. Again, the key takeaway is that we're taking a 2D matrix, a smaller fi filter matrix, and sliding it over this 2D input. This idea of taking a filter of weights and applying it sort of iteratively across a more global input is the exact idea that's, implement, that's implemented in graph convolutional neural networks, where now we are representing our data not as a 2D matrix, but rather as a set of nodes and a set of edges that connect those nodes and preserve some degree of information about the relationship of the nodes to one another. And again, graph convolutional neural networks function by take learning weights for a feature kernel, which again is just like a weight matrix that we saw in uh, convolutional networks. And now, rather than sliding that weight kernel over a 2D matrix, 
that kernel is effectively going to traverse the graph going around to different nodes. And at each instance of this traversal, it's going to look at what are the neighboring um, nodes of, of a particular node according to the edges of the graph. And we're going to iteratively apply matrix multiplication operations to extract some features about the local connectivity of the graph structure. And this process is applied iteratively over the course of the entire graph structure, such that the learning process can pick up on weights that can extract and pick up on information about the patterns of connectivity and structure that exist to the graph. And so this process repeats iteratively across all the nodes in the graph going forward, such that at the end, at the end of this iterative operation, we can then aggregate the information that was uh, picked up by each of these iterative node um, visits and use this to build a gl more global representation of what the feature, feature space could look like for this uh, graph example shown here. So this is a very, very brief, very high level overview of the idea behind graph convolutional networks, but hopefully you get a bit of intuition about how they work and why they can be very relevant to a variety of data types, data modalities, and application areas. And indeed, graph neural networks are now being used in a variety of different domains, ranging from applications in chemistry, biology, uh, looking at modeling small molecules according to a graph-like structure, which naturally you can think of it right, as having the atoms in that small molecule be represented uh, the atoms and the elements in that small molecule being represented as nodes in a graph, and the local bond structure that connects these uh, individual atoms together as vertices, uh, excuse me, as, as edges in the graph. Uh, yeah, as edges in the graph, um, preserving some local structure about what the uh, structure of the molecule looks like. And in fact, these very same types of gra graph convolutional networks were used a couple years ago to discover a novel antibiotic compound called halicin that had very potent antibiotic properties and was structurally completely dissimilar from traditional classes of antibiotics. And so really this, this idea of imposing this graph structure to model and represent uh, small molecules has tremendous applications in drug discovery and in therapeutic design. Other application areas include the, the context of urban mobility, urban planning, traffic prediction. And so Google Maps, it turns out, uses graph-based architectures to uh, model the flow of traffic in cities and use these uh, models to actually improve their estimates of estimated time of arrival for providing directions uh, returned to the user via Google, Google Maps which is a functionality that I know all of us are very likely to appreciate. And finally, in the, in the past couple of years, due to the uh, nature of the COVID-19 pandemic, initially at the start of the pandemic, there was a lot of excitement ab about applying deep learning and AI to various problems related to COVID-19 from both the public health perspective as well as you know, the fundamental biology perspective and diagnosis perspective. And so one example using graph neural networks was in incorporating both spatial data and temporal data to perform very accurate forecasting of the likely spread of COVID-19 in uh, local neighborhoods and local communities. A final example of a different type and class of data that we may encounter in addition to graphs, sequences, 2D images is that of 3D sets of points which often are called point clouds. And they're effectively completely unordered sets of, of a cloud of points, where still there's some degree of spatial dependence between the points. And much like as we saw with convolutional neural networks and 2D images, we can perform many of the same types of prediction problems on this 3D uh, types of data structures. And it turns out that graph convolutional neural networks can be extended very naturally to these point cloud data sets. And the way this is done is by actually dynamically computing graphs as, uh, as a, effectively a mesh present in a uh, 3D space 
where this point cloud exists. And so you can think of this graph structure as being imposed on this 3D point cloud manifold, where you can use the graph to effectively preserve the connectivity of the points and maintain spatial invariance. Really, really cool stuff being done in this domain in applications like neural rendering and 3D graphics. All right, so the final and second sort of new frontier research direction I'm going to touch on is this idea of automated machine learning and learning to learn. And over the, the course of five years of teaching this course, every single year, one of the most popular questions and most popular areas of interest for you all has been this question of how do we actually design neural network architectures? How do we choose hyperparameters? How do we um, optimize the model design itself to achieve the best performance on our desired task? And this is really one of the fundamental motivations behind this idea of automated machine learning, where, as you've probably seen, there's, there's a bit of alchemy, there's a bit of mysticism behind how you actually go about building an architecture for some problem of interest. And there's a degree of practice, of trial and error, and of ex expert knowledge that's involved in this process. And so the motivation behind this field of automated machine learning is what if we could what if we could use AI what if we could use machine learning to actually uh, solve this design problem in the first place and so the goal here is to try to build a learning algorithm that learns which model specified by its its hyperparameters its architecture could be most effective at solving a given problem and this is this idea of AutoML. And so the original AutoML framework, and there have been many, many extensions and efforts that have extended beyond this, used a reinforcement learning setup, where there were these um, two components, the first being what they called a controller neural net architecture. And the function of this controller architecture was to effectively propose a sample architecture, what the model potentially could look like. And the way is this, this is defined is in terms of the hyperparameters of that network, right? The number of filters, the number of layers, so on and so forth. And then, following this effective spawning of a sample candidate architecture by the controller network, that network was then in turn trained to get some accuracy, some predictive accuracy on a desired task. And as a result of that, the feedback and the performance of that actual evaluation was then used to inform the training of the controller, iteratively improving the controller algorithm itself to improve its architecture proposals for the next round of optimization. And this process is iteratively repeated over the course of training many, many times, generating architectures, testing them, giving, that the, giving the resulting feedback to the controller to actually learn from. And eventually, the idea is that the controller will converge to propose architectures that achieve better accuracies on some uh, data set of interest and will assign low, uh, low output probabilities to architectures that perform poorly. So to get a little bit more sense about how these agents actually work, the idea is that at each step of this iterative algorithm, your controller is actually proposing a brand new network architecture based on predictions of hyperparameters of that network, right? So if you had a, a convolutional network, for example, these parameters could include the number of filters, the, the size of those filters, the degree of striding you're employing, so on and so forth. And the next step after taking that child's network is to then take your training data from your original task of interest use that child network that was spawned by this RNN controller and generate a prediction and compute an accuracy um, from that prediction that could then be used to update the actual RNN controller um, to propose iteratively better and better architectures as a function of its training. And more recently, th this idea of, of AutoML has been extended from this original reinforcement learning framework to this broader idea of neural architecture search, right? Where, again, 
we're trying to search over some design space of potential architecture uh, designs and hyperparameters hyper to try to identify optimal, optimally performing models. And so this has really um, kind of exploded and is very commonly used in modern machine learning and deep learning design pipelines, particularly in, in industrial applications. So for example, um, designing new architectures for image recognition. And what is remarkable is that this idea of AutoML is not just hype, right? It turns out that these um, algorithms are actually quite strong at designing new architectures that perform very, very well. And what you can see on this plot that I'm going to show on the right is the performance on a image re object recognition task of networks that were designed by humans. And what I'm now going to show you in, in red is the performance of architectures that were proposed by an AutoML algorithm. And what you can appreciate is that the neural architecture search and AutoML pipeline was able to produce architectures that actually achieved superior accuracy on this image recognition task with fewer parameters. And, and more recently, and extending finally beyond this, there's been a lot of interest in taking this concept of AutoML and extending it to this broader idea of auto AI, designing entire data processing, learning, prediction pipelines that go end to end to um, sort of beginning from data curation all the way to deployment and using AI machine learning algorithms as a way to actually optimize the components of this process itself. And so I encourage you to think about what it would mean if we could actually achieve this capability of designing AI that can generate new neural networks and new machine learning model, models that can be very, very performant on tasks of interest. Of course, this will reduce our troubles and our difficulty in actually designing the networks themselves, but it also gets at this heart of this broader question about what it actually means to be intelligent, sort of alluding back to how Alexander opened the course and started this lecture series. And I hope that as a result of, of our course and as a result of your participation, you've gained a bit more appreciation about what are the connections and distinctions between human learning, human intelligence, and some of these deep learning models that we've been exploring this week. And so with that, I'll close and um, conclude the lecture. And finally, make a final point about reminding you about our open office hour session, which is going to occur from now till about 4 p.m. We'll be there to answer questions about the labs, about the lectures, and importantly, in 10 to 50 in person, we will be distributing the class t-shirts. So please come by. Uh, we will be there to distribute the t-shirts um, right after this. And with that, um, once again, thank you all so much for your attention and your participation. We really enjoyed this and doing this every year. And I hope to see many of you very shortly in 10 to 50. Thank you so much.